but do you at all see yourself as uh, having played a rough game and then been a victim of it? Um, it's an excellent question. Uh, there was a 5 o'clock briefing, and um, the, uh, the media did stamp it as uh, 5 o'clock filers. Uh, regardless of what they were told at the, uh, at the briefing, and the briefing was done by uh, officers that uh, were in Saigon, and they were reading reports and so forth that they got from the field. But those reporters had, uh, had the option of going out in the field and talking to anybody they chose. I mean, they had a free reign. I mean, there was no... There was no effort, official effort, to try to deny information to them. As a matter of fact, uh, what we tried to do is to give them uh, uh, full information and urge them to go out and see for themselves. So it wasn't a, it wasn't a closed uh, society that they were having to deal with. But somebody had to be a spokesman, and the people that did the briefing, of course, were not uh, fighting officers. They were, they were reading the reports. And in some cases, I am quite sure that they, uh, they didn't maybe have the flavor of the situation to the extent that they might have. Um, as you know, this was my third war, and the first war we had uh, very strong censorship, World War II. If you wrote a letter to your wife, some censor read that letter, and if it was a, a, a name or a date in that letter, he took a pair of scissors and cut it out. It was strict censorship for two purposes. One was we wanted to not deny anything that would help the enemy and give him better intelligence on our situation. And secondly, they wanted uh, a second purpose of censorship was to keep the American public unified behind the war. Now, there were atrocities that took place in World War II that were not made known until after the war was over because the authorities, the president, and the leadership did not want to take any step that would divide the American public from being staunchly in support of war. In the Korean War, there was also censorship, but in neither World War II or Korea did we have TV. TV added another dimension. Mr. Johnson told me before he died, he was an ill man, he was out of office. As a matter of fact, I'd retired then too. He, uh, he died about a year after I retired. He said he made a mistake in not imposing censorship. Now, I'm not sure, and I don't want to bore you with details, I'm not sure it was practical to impose censorship. If censorship were to be imposed, it had to be imposed by the sovereign power, and that was not us. That was Republic of South Vietnam. They didn't have the capability of implementing censorship. We could have helped them, but it would probably have taken six months to set up a system to help them. It's a very compl complex mechanism. And even if that had been set up, it would have been very easy to short-circuit the system by having a reporter write a story or take some film and put it in the hands of a courier and get on a commercial plane in uh, Tonsonuk outside of uh, Saigon and fly it to Manila or Bangkok or or Singapore, or Hong Kong, and followed in another sovereign country. So I, I, censorship, I think, would have, would have probably been a failure. Um, yes, I think that uh, there were times when the briefing officers uh, probably, not intentionally, but perhaps gave a false impression. And sometimes a, a, a reporter would stand up and said, I was just there and I saw that action and you don't have the full information, and he would brief his colleagues on what he saw. It was, it was a wide-open situation, and there's no effort to uh, impose to, to try to deny any information, and even if, if somebody was fool enough to try, foolish enough to try to do that, it, it, it never would have worked. Have I answered your question or helped you? Well, do you think that it's sort of inherently a, a stiff game between the military and the press and that oh, you just well, were a victim yeah, of it uh, or one yeah, of its successes? I, was, I meant to mention this. Uh, inevitably, there is an adversary relationship, and it probably was, it was uh, not present in World War II because the, the reporters wore our uniform, and they went into battle with us. 
But when they went into battle, they didn't have a camera like you see over there in a the sound box and three guys carrying it. Uh, they, came, they went in with a notebook and a, and a pad. Uh, no entry soldier wants a, a device like that television set following him into battle because that gives away his position. And people manning an apparatus like that are in a very dangerous position from the front and the rear. Uh, I'm not saying uh, be, they've been hit accidentally, but uh, uh, it, it, it's a pretty, pretty dangerous place. But uh, there was no adversary relationship then because they were, uh, we felt that they were part of us. Uh, likewise in Korea, but there was an adversary relationship that developed in Vietnam that I'm not sure it could have been avoided. Thank you. Please. Yes, I wanted to take advantage of uh, your offer to answer questions not about what you spoke to him about tonight, uh, but about the war. And in particular, uh, are you, you expressed your concern with international law. And I was wondering if you're familiar with the Russell Tribunal, um, the, what tribunal? the Russell Tribunal, which was led by Bertrand Russell. Oh, and yes. Is, okay, uh, yeah, and it's, in, uh, in Stockholm, yes. Right. And mm -hmm. that was uh, cons uh, investigating uh, the American uh, involvement in Vietnam and, and w uh, if the Geneva co Conventions and so on were being followed. And they found uh, uh, flagrant uh, and multiple violations of the Geneva uh, Conventions, and it was documented in, uh, on genocide, which, uh, which is a book by John Paul Sartre. And I was wondering if the military establishment ever took these, uh, these uh, considerations seriously. Uh, I'm not aware that they did take cognizance of that. I remember when it took place. Uh, I think it was a general feeling that this was propaganda. But uh, uh, I, I'm in no position to pass any particular that judgment was, that myself. Was a, that was a general feeling then, that the specific charges were never refuted or investigated? Um, this I can't say because I was on the battlefield at the time, and it could be, I, I would suspect that they probably were. They probably were. Sir. Oh, please, sir. Yes, having served in the I Corps with uh, Lima Company 3rd Battalion, 9th Marines, and following the CBS uh, uh, trial and seeing the interview with myself on TV, I found that the news media, CBS in particular, very simplistically thought that uh, we could have gone into, say, the Asha Valley and said, with a chalkboard and said, with all the North Vietnamese and hardcore VC and VC, raise your hand so we can count you. And anyone that thought that that was possible to walk in there with a chalkboard without getting his butt shot off is, is kind of crazy and foolish. Uh, so to put that to rest, all the intelligence in the world could not have counted what we were up against uh, for numbers, uh, in my estimation, as being a grunt myself in the field. Uh, we, as grunts, uh, having fought battles, never knew the size of the troops we were up against, as I'm sure you're well aware of. As that's a point. Question being, though, do you believe, had not there been the political atmosphere back here in the States, that the outcome of what we fought for in Vietnam could have been different? Yes. Uh, let me, uh, let me uh, discuss this because it, uh, it is not a simple yes or no matter. Uh, Mr. Johnson's first uh, order when we got involved in Vietnam was that he would not broaden the war. That meant that the war could not be broadened geographically. We couldn't go into Laos, we couldn't go into Cambodia. And it was felt in those early days that the Geneva uh, 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 Accords in 1954 and the Geneva Agreement on Laos in 1962 both produced, or both to be policed by the ICC, the International Control Commission, uh, which uh, consisted of a, of a committee, a commission, headed by an Indian ambassador with a Canadian ambassador and a Polish ambassador being a member. And there were quite a number of people, mostly military officers from all three of those countries that were associated with them. And they were located in Saigon. 
I think uh, as a country we were somewhat naive at the outset that, that those two agreements uh, could be policed. Uh, it was impossible, and uh, as a matter of fact, they didn't, the ICC didn't seem to have much motivation in order to police it. As a result, we had an almost uh, an unprecedented open flank to the west of almost 700 miles. Absolutely unprecedented. You can't defend a 700-mile front. All we could do it was lightly outpost it with special forces camps. Therefore, the enemy could have attacked any time along that huge front, uh, whether it be uh, no, uh, no Vietnamese, no Arvin, no Vietnamese uh, military elements, or, and none of ours. And that happened to a degree in the Tet Offensive. And that meant that strategically I had to, to uh, keep reserves available in order to react when they crossed the border, because they had full reign across the border, and we were not allowed to cross it. And we were able to keep them off balance despite that huge front because of the helicopter, which for the first time was used on the battlefield to move troops, uh, the uh, Cobra as a gunship, and uh, the medical evacuation, the uh, helicopter ambulances. Uh, we were therefore confined geographically. Now, the enemy put everything he had into the fight at Tet of 1968, and he got, he got uh, defeated, and I mean seriously defeated. And uh, any Vietnamese, uh, North Vietnamese generals have, and politicians have now admitted that. <clears throat> if we had used our air power the way it could have been used, in the way Mr. Nixon did in 70, late 72, if that had been done four years earlier, I believe that the enemy would have been brought to the conference table, we would, could have negotiated from the position of strength, and the agreement could have been arri arrived at, and that south, uh, the territory of South Vietnam could be free at this time. However, let me hesitate to say that if that had happened, and I think it could have happened and probably would have happened, we would have to have some military forces in Southeast Asia now to enforce the agreement. I would remind you that we do not have a peace agreement in Korea. We've got an armistice. And to force that armistice, we've got 40,000 American troops still in Korea. So you've got to, if you have an agreement, particularly with the communist nation, you've got to have military forces to enforce that agreement. Thank you. Thank you. Please, Gen ma General, I'd like to return to the issue that you were discussing earlier. Right. You've described the um, financial and psychological burden that that you went through and your lawyers went through in, in um, play, prosecuting your claim. You've also discussed how you felt that you might have gotten a 50-50 jury verdict and you, and you ended uh, up I settling. Couldn't, couldn't hear that now. I said you said that you thought your chances at winning with yeah, the jury right, was 50-50 right, right, and, you, right. and you ended up settling the case. Yeah. Do you perhaps find this indicative of the fact that our legal system might not be equipped to handle actions that involve so much um, historical inquiry yes. um, and public debate about essentially what were policy issues. Yes. And don't you perhaps think that maybe there are other ways than going through mm -hmm. the legal system that you could have could have vindicated what you felt mm -hmm. um, was a well. I'm so glad. CBS. I'm so glad you asked that question. I was hoping you would. I would have asked it myself if you hadn't. <laughs> uh, you are so right. I made a talk, I wrote an editorial for, for the op-ed piece of the New York Times, which was published uh, about 10 days in the Sunday uh, Week in Review section of the New York Times, about 10 days after the settlement. I then talked to the National Press Club in Washington. Uh, and I have uh, made a similar talk to a number, of, well, to a number of bar associations. Uh, as you have implied, a courtroom is no place to, to decide history. There is no place to pass judgment on a battlefield. There are very few jurors that have a feeling of this. And uh, th uh, they were dealing with, with complex things that they had no background on, and it was awfully difficult for them to grasp it. 
Now, the solution that I can't have come up with, and, and I, I feel very strongly about it, but I did not bring it out in my own remarks intentionally, that I think we need a National News Council. The British have it. It works well with them. The state of Minnesota has a state news council. And these councils consist of uh, well-respected journalists, respected for their integrity, that will, uh, uh, will hear complaints that are given as to uh, reckless media. And uh, before I ever, this is a general pattern that's followed, that they, both sides will agree there'd be no, chance, no, no money involved. It'd be a matter of prestige or adherence to principles. But these distinguished journalists would uh, make the judgment and the two parties would agree in advance that they would accept as final the judgment 